Cool. Welcome, everyone. So back when Tech Lancaster first started, I gave a five-minute lightning talk about how I was real upset that the people were driving too fast on the streets. Um, and I got so fired up about it that I did a bunch more work, and I thought, oh, hell yeah, this would be a fun presentation. So now you all get to experience that um, exuberance and excitement. But if you drove in today and you didn't walk here, that's OK. I view this as a fun exercise for me to have fun with technology. And it's my little hill to die on. Just let me die on it, OK? This is not intended in any way as any type of you know, me being mad at anyone. It's all just for fun. But that being said, people drive too damn fast on these roads in the city. <laughs> What you, may not know, what you may or may not know about the city is, first of all, all these eight streets I'm talking about are all two-way or two-lane, one-way streets that have a 25 mile an hour speed limit. Do you know why they are that way? You get two questions. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to? You want that to be one of your two? Sure. sure. Okay. Okay. Do you know why they are that yes, way? I was actually about to say that. You wasted a question. So back <laughs> back in the 70s, they converted them to be two-way. And that is for a couple reasons, but mostly because it's way more efficient. You no, can make right. No, it's not. The reason they did that because people were riding around their cars, jalopies, yelling, screaming, and they did that to prevent that from going around. I look forward to when you give your talk. Uh, from my perspective, the reason they did that is because it's just crazy efficient to have one ways. One ways are awesome if you're in a car. You go really fast. If somebody stops on the road, you can go around them super easy. You're not stuck behind them. Um, you can take right on reds, and you can go around really fast. And you can time lights super easily. Too easily, maybe. But these are all state highways, and I think people drive way too damn fast on them. Um, yeah, this is me. Um, why does this matter? Well, for me, I, I live in the city. I walk in the city every day. And this is a really good thing Lancaster actually put out. It shows like if you get hit by a car at 20 miles an hour, you're probably going to live. But if you hit it 40 miles an hour, you're probably going to die. And part of that reason is like when you're driving at 40 miles an hour, you're zoned in like this. When you're driving at 15, I mean, your, your eyes are looking everywhere because you're bored, right? But the point is that solar speeds save lives. Don't believe me? This is a graph that shows <laughs> Deaths have gone up in Lancaster in the last, you know, every year basically until this graph ended. And I got, the, I got this from a presentation that Lancaster did. The point is 18 people are dying a year because cars are going fast, probably because they're going 40. And this is a map of where people are dying in the city when they're hit by cars. So a lot of these are on those busy roads I just highlighted. Um, and yeah, frankly, that, that, that's a lot. And like, these charts are put up by Vision Zero Lancaster. They're doing a lot of great work. The goal is nobody dies by being hit by a car. That's a great goal. It's going to take them many years. But I was fired up today. And I don't have patience, or I didn't have patience for what the city was trying to do. So I, this is what I talked about last talk. I took Google Maps and I like, saw how fast it would go, be, according to Google Maps, to go across the city. And I realized, like, wow, like, even including lights, Google Maps is saying you can go 24 miles an hour across the entire city. And then I went and I mapped that using, Google Ma or, uh, using Grafana and like, you know, plugging a bunch of data in, using that Google Maps API. And Google, Google's pretty cool how they actually have live traffic. Here. So like, if Google says it'll take you so long, it's usually pretty close. Um, and they're showing, it's, it's hard to read the graph, and this is just a summary of last presentation. You can go back and watch it if you want. The point is, in the middle of the night, whenever those lines are going above that red line, Google's saying, hey, you can actually get through the entire city from one end to the other on some of these roads faster than 25 miles an hour. So Google is saying, hey, this, this is a real convenient way to cut across the city. Um, and then I went and I drove across the entire city and I mapped individual areas, or like, like I used Strava to basically map how fast I was going. And I found that for a bunch of areas in the city, the lights are so perfectly timed that you can actually go 35, 40 miles an hour and feel like you're just driving with traffic. You don't even feel like you're going fast. So that was last talk. But what if we, like I kind of got real excited. Like what if we could use consumer security cameras in everybody's window 
to track the speed of cars as they flew across the city. Maybe then we could enact change. Sounded like a good idea, right? So I, I got real fired up about this. I kind of ignored the cameras in every window part. Um, and I was like, I put a camera in one window, it was like my phone camera, and I got video of a bunch of cars driving by. And I said, hey, what if I figured out how to make like, this camera, this footage, tell me how fast the car is going? So I was like, hey, given a video stream, can I find a way to identify individual cars and then track them across multiple frames of that video at real time and get their speed? I was like, that'd be kind of cool, but I know nothing about any of this. But like, they're making self-driving cars now, how hard could it be? <laughs> so there's a couple cool tools, and the answer is not actually that hard. It was annoying, but it's, it's cool. I'm going to show it to you now. So you two can make a uh, fancy camera stick in your window if you want. Um, but so OpenCV, for those who haven't used it, it's a cool little Python library. It's, it's, it's a cross-platform. It works with every language. It's like, a, I don't know, probably written in C. And it, I don't actually have a great explanation for what it is, but it lets you read, write, process images, draw things on them, do object detection, tracking, and other algorithms. And it's OK. Um, but then there's also this thing called YOLO v5. That is actually what they use at a lot of self-driving companies. It stands for you only look once. And they had this graph that shows it being better than something else. I, I immediately latched onto it as this is fast. And because we're looking for real time anyway, that's the ideal situation. So YOLO is, is basically like real time object detection. It's using like a pre-trained neural net. And I'm not going to explain what a neural net is. Um, but so quickly, I was able to rip out code that looks something like this. Import those two libraries I talked about, load in the video, load in the neural net, which is line six there, where I'm just loading in this YOLO5. And then you can basically go frame by frame with this while true loop. You're basically reading in frame by frame, passing in each frame, which is just an image, to, and, and passing that to your model. And the model actually outputs a series of objects it found. So it's really that easy. And then I can use CV2 on that image to draw a little box with some text that says car. And it's really that easy to get, boom, there we go. We have a whole bunch of cars labeled. That's pretty cool. And you know that window, yeah. <laughs> that's where my desk is. Uh, and you know, that's really great. Some of these are not being labeled. And that's because when you have these neural nets, they're trained for sides of cars, basically. They're not trained for backs of cars, like that Tesla up there, or this truck when it's missing pieces. But for the most part, it does a pretty decent job at getting a lot of cars. That's pretty cool. But, whoop. And you know, that's kind of slow because it has to process this entire image pass it to the neural net and identify cars. But for my purposes, I was able to speed up this process because I'm trying to do real time, right? I was able to speed up by taking this little tiny yellow box and only searching that area. So I basically just told it to look at only these pixels. And there you go, boom, you can see like it caught two cars. Um, but it turns out object detection is super easy. These little neural nets like I showed you, there's tutorials all across the internet on how to do that. I'm no genius. And it basically, you can detect a bunch of cars or people or toasters, it turns out. There's a lot of stuff in these neural nets. It can detect where they are. But then when you go from frame to frame, you don't have any reference of this is the same car we saw in that last frame. That's where it gets a little bit more complicated. But I'm going to explain it as best I can. So, this is an example of object tracking. They do competitions. This is the competition winner from last year. So what they do is they post a video, and they have to write really complicated software to draw boxes around the different people. And if you, if you saw, there's like a bike rider swirling around. There's people crisscrossing. It's crazy hard stuff, but that's what it should look like. And the way that you get there, when I was doing it myself, and I did a very rudimentary version, I'm going to talk through it just like in, in, at a high level. And this code is kind of pseudocode. It works, but I'm skipping some lines. But basically, when I'm going, when I get that series of objects, 
What I have to do is first of all see if I already have an object that looks like that. So I look through objects that I've already collected, and if it's unique, I can go ahead and create a new tracking object that is just a regular Python object. I validate that, hey, is this object that I've created actually big enough to be a car? I do some sanity checking, and then I, I, create, I, I throw that new object in a list of tracking objects, which I can then next frame through, compare to see, okay, have I already been tracking that one? Once I have that object, I can use OpenCV. They have a tracking library. So what you do is you pass in a bounding box of where you think theoretically a car is. So in this example, I'm passing into a, tra a, a tracking library called Tracker KCF. I tried like 30 different tracking libraries that are included in OpenCV. OpenCV is a hodgepodge of stuff, but it has all these tracking libraries, and I finally found one that was actually reasonably fast and didn't get lost on the cars. So I pass in to this um, tracker that OpenCV has, the bounding box of the car, and then what I can do is every frame I run update on each object. That's just like a, a method on my object here. And it, what it does is it runs the dot .update function on that tracker with the new frame. And what it does is it says, hey, this was the bounding box before. There was a car. We have a new frame. Based on what we think, based on what this object had been doing, can we find that car again? Right? And it can theoretically get the car. So once I have the difference between those two objects, between the two different frames, which basically, when, after I run update, I get a new location. And I had the old location, which is actually that self.tensor object. I can basically say, hey, I can take an attempt at how, determining how fast it's going. I can remove the object if the car stops moving. So if I see that it hasn't moved for like five frames in a row, I can just remove that object because it might be a parked car, for example. Um, I can add like a new update the box. And if we have enough data points, I can mark down the speed. So all this to say, I was able to get it working like this. We we're able to grab a car estimate a speed, and then after a certain point, mark it as complete, um, which technically is when it flashes green. So this is an example of what I was able to get working. Um, the most important thing to note here is up in the top left, I'm showing how long it takes to do the different things. Oh yeah, you can see here. So how long it takes me to track the objects, how long it takes me to run the YOLO neural net, and how long in total it takes per frame. So if you take the total per frame, you divide it, or divide it by one, that's the frames per second, um, or the other way around. And what you can see, I'll, I'll play it one more time so you can see how, basically, it, it's real time here, but the tracking takes 14 milliseconds when it has something. YOLO almost always takes 30 milliseconds, and then it's actually taking a little longer because I'm writing these frames out to disk so that I can you know, show it here. But up in the top left, you can see I'm averaging about eight or nine frames per second. And this is after a lot of optimization attempts. Um, and that is nowhere near the frames per second of these cameras, which are usually like 24 or 30 frames per second. So I wasn't able to get real time. I'm sure I could have uh, if I really plowed time into it. But you know, and, and now I, I jokingly ask questions, so who, who's ready to put my camera in your window? Um, that was kind of what I ran into. I put a lot of energy into this, and I had some people I talked to who were like, oh yeah, yeah, like let's do it, let's do it. And then when I was like, hey, here's the camera, everybody's like, yeah, because uh, you know. I, I have this big tree in front of my house, and I'm like, oh, let's do your window. You live on Orange Street. Um, this idea kind of has died. Uh, it, it was a lot of fun, I ran with it. Um, it's pretty cool to talk about, and I'm like always happy to, to riff on this more, and if somebody does want to put the camera in their window, and lives on a really fast street. All right. So there were a couple other problems beyond finding somebody, and I will be right over after this talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> most, if not all, consumer smart cameras do not allow programmatic access to a live video stream. They're really, really not giving you that very easily. So I have at home, I have a Eufy, I have a Nest. I bought, because they're only 24 bucks, a Wise and a Blink. And both of those claim to have API, they had like Python wrappers built by people. Just really couldn't get it to work. I was able to get individual frames. But with Eufy, 
I was able to get download 30 second clips by reverse engineering the API on their website, which was pretty cool. So I could get 30 second clips and run things through with that. Um, but the best solution, what a lot of people do online is Raspberry Pis with a camera module, so you can do processing on the Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pis are really fucking expensive right now, which is really annoying. Or maybe you could get a computer with a webcam. But the other problem is security cameras have these like crazy wide angle lenses. So when the car is going, it's actually not a consistent speed. Yeah, it's not linear. Also, theoretically, let's say you were to put cameras on everybody's house, that bounding box I was putting in, I'd have to adjust. I have to find out where the street is. If they actually bump the camera, it's broken. I have to go out in the street and take like one of those rolly things and measure how far is this. It, it turned out that maybe I was biting off more than I could chew. I had fun with it. But then I was like, what about drones? <laughs> what if we could just fire drones up in the air and then we could turn the camera on on a street and track it, right? So I did that. And what I was able to get. <laughs> and that's the police car following. You know, look at this. This thing's badass. Like, I was able to get the cars, you know, find like a, a reasonable heuristic on speed, and you know, it, it worked great. The problem is, you got to put a drone up there, and that's super annoying. You might as well stand there with a the camera on the ground like this. Everybody's like looking up, like, Why, who's flying a drone? Who's that asshole? Um, but yeah, I did that um, just just because I wanted to prove it could work. It's exact like it's the exact same software. It's the exact same software, just like with a different bounding box. Are there any laws against doing anything like that? No. Uh -uh. Thanks. As long as you stay under the. Uh, as long as you don't read the laws, <laughs> like it's it's that simple. <laughs> um, but the the other interesting thing about this is um, every one of the like the drone has super high resolution when the cameras I was using before had lower. So like, it just completely changes all the calculations I have to do, the size of the car, like da 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 And I'm sure I could like do things like taking the width and trying to do math, but it just turned out to be super annoying to move between different cameras every time. I have to sit there for like 15 minutes at least finicking it, and that's after you know what you're doing. Um, but I still, I, I was desperate. I needed live traffic data. I need to know how fast these cars are going. I need a map that shows for real how fast the cars are going. So completely unrelatedly, I have a big beef with RRTA. Do people know what this is? It's our bus system. Who took the bus here? No, nobody took the bus. Nobody takes the bus because it's impossible to know where the bus is, when it's coming. You can't, anyway, it's another issue. I love the bus. Um, I was trying to look up on their glorious website how to get from point A to point B, and something just stood out to me. Whoa, the buses are moving on this website. They're moving. Like these little icons here, every like 15 seconds, they go doop, 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 doop. And I was like, wait a minute. How are they getting this data? I'm not logged in. So I went in the Chrome DevTools. Whoa, there it is. They're basically making these little web requests Read 15 seconds. It doesn't just include the exact location of the bus, it includes the speed of the bus, as reported by the bus itself, not by the distance between the last point. It is like literally from the speedometer of the bus. Um, the what? You got your vector now. Yeah. Uh, what are they gonna do, sue me? Um, for real. Um, <laughs> but there's some really fun stuff in here too. So there's, there's um, the driver's name, Simpson. Uh, there's like last updated, um, the actual name, like the, the bus itself, trip ID, ride ID. There's a lot of fun stuff in here. And then I found, whoa, if I just, look at this. Every single bus, I, I clicked every button on the website and I loaded every single bus up. And I got all these buses on here and I'm like, whoa, that's like all the streets. Like I've got it. Like I've got almost all these streets now mapped with buses. So then I pull up DevTools again and all they do is modify the request to just include all the buses. And they're doing this on the website like literally every 15 seconds. So I'm like, why don't I write my own script that does this on my computer and logs it out indefinitely to a file? So that's what I did. 
I wrote this. It just writes it out to a file based on the um, bus, um, the, the route ID, which is, you know, there's only like 12 or 15 uh, routes. And I logged out the last updated information, vehicle ID, speed, latitude, longitude. And I cut it off, but I also included the bus driver's name because it's too much fun. Um, and first of all, I, I collected like 100,000 plus location or speed points per bus. Um, so I've got, you know, megabytes worth of data. It's not big data. Like I can, I can write even bad code and go through it all and really fast. Um, I got a lot of data points. It lets me do fun stuff like this. Like I now know the fastest bus drivers. <laughs> so this, I, 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 I I very much obscured the names. These are made up names in the same theme as the name. Like I took the name and it would be like, I, McDonald was like very similar to that person's name. I had very much fun with it. But the, um, I was, and these are like the point where they're going this fast. All of these points are the fastest speed they went within the bounds of the city. And the city has a 25 mile an hour limit. So these are all bus drivers going faster than 25, well, Mr. McDonald up here going 39 miles an hour in city limits. Where did this happen? On Prince Street, right before you get to the train station. Um, or no, Queen Street, sorry, right before you get to the train station. Um, all these are interesting places in the city. So I was like, hell, well, first of all, then I went and I, I did all types of other fun stuff. So like, I, took, I just did an MD5 hash of all the bus drivers' names because I was too lazy to come up with fake names for all 70 bus drivers. But... I got the total number of data points I had for each within the city. And they do a lot outside the city. This is the, the data points I had per bus driver. And you can see then the total of them that were faster than 25 miles an hour, faster than 30 miles an hour, and how many of their total data points are faster than 25 miles an hour. Some of these bus drivers, now like this list goes really deep. There's a lot of bus drivers work for RTA. But look at this, Some of the, like all these top, my top, fifth, my top 25 lists here, all of them are going faster than 25 miles an hour, like 10% of the time. It's crazy. Um, this is a map of, this is a, a, like a heat map of where people were caught going 35 miles an hour or more within the city, which is basically the whole city. You can see that part on King there getting out of the city. They're picking up speed for the 35, but like it's the whole city. New Holland Ave is a 25, like all this is 25s. And they're all going really fast. So I've got my data. Here's the, here's the places where they went faster than 25 miles an hour. Um, good. That was pretty fun. Um, and this is just mapping up that same map where people get hurt. Yeah, right. It's a whole damn city. They're driving fast everywhere. It's not just the two ways, unfortunately, but, or the one ways, but the one ways are a lot of them. Um, and you know, I, I had a lot of fun with mapping all this, and there's a lot of cool things I could do with this. But at the end of the day, Jonathan posted this in, in Slack, and I thought it was really cool. I really liked it. He said, um, there's this tweet by some guy who said, hey, and I should have learned how to pronounce this before I came in. Is this Hel Hel Helsinki. Helsinki. Helsinki, yeah, right. Um, they had a 75 drop in road deaths, and they said, um, how much has IT played in reducing these crashes? And they're like, none. We just slowed down the cars. And this is like right after I'd done all this work. I was like, oh, right. You just got to slow them down. And, you know, it's fun doing all this other work, but I feel like at the end of the day, when you're looking at, this is from the walkability study they did in Lancaster like five or six years ago. If you're driving from out of the city and you get to the city and there's a 25 mile an hour speed limit and you stick to it versus driving 45 miles an hour, it adds 48 seconds to your commute, right? Um, from my perspective, it's not really a big deal. You know, I walk this city, I walk here, I walk everywhere in this city. And for me, the difference between somebody going 25 miles and 45 miles an hour is basically potentially my life, right? And for other people, it's a 48 second commute, in addition to their commute. That's my perspective on this. But I understand, and so I, I thought, hell, maybe I could write like a little simulation of like the little blue dots are supposed to be cars, and these are supposed to be lights and timed lights. I got all into this. 
And then I ran out of energy on it and I didn't end up turning the little dots into cars. But one day maybe I will. But I thought maybe we could just like show people in some way, some really cool visual way like, hey, here's a knob and a slider. Like if you just drag the slider to change the timing of the lights, hey, it takes you this much longer to get from point A to point B. But if you were to hit somebody with this more, you know, you just kind of visualize that and show people in like a web app. That was one idea. Um, the other idea I did that I didn't actually include on this is I took like a video and I tried to time the lights in Lancaster. So I tried to catch like three or four lights in a row with a video. And the lights are not actually timed in a way that makes sense. You'd think that they're timed so you can consistently drive at 25 miles an hour, but it's not. Sometimes you're driving 25 miles an hour and you get screwed by a light that turns right in front of you. And that's, that's really annoying. But a lot of times it's the opposite. What they do is they turn lights green in front of you way faster than 25 miles an hour. They turn lights on in front of you so you can go, even when you're going with the lights at the head of the lights, like 35, 40 miles an hour. Um, so I'm still fired up about like how we can fix this. Um, there's a lot of ways we can fix this. I think basically all of them have people who are, have a really good argument against, like we can narrow the streets and then theoretically cars won't feel like they're on a highway anymore. The problem is like, we just narrowed Walnut. They put all this energy into it. And I live next to Walnut, and they drive really fast on Walnut. People drive really fast on Walnut. And it, it doesn't seem to have worked. We can convert everything back to two-way. That's the dream. Um, but it's super expensive, and it could take years. And these are state highways that people are trying to get through, and there's a lot of political opposition to it. We could switch light timings from 25 to 20 miles an hour. Um, this is fine. It means that people probably still be able to go to 25 because unless you're like right on the edge of the lights, if you're a little behind, you can still go a lot faster. Um, but you know, it just kind of penalizes the good drivers in a lot of ways. Um, you could just ticket people. You could like force people to respect the speed limit. But like, people hate when you get more tickets. Like even if you're going like 26, it feels like you get ticketed in these systems where they have automatic ticket guns. And speed bumps just suck for everyone. Like, I would never advocate for that. But, like, you know, there's all these ways that are advocated for fixing this. But I think, like, really it boils down to, like, there are a lot of great ways. Um, and really, I think it boils down to, like, it's politics. And I think that was where I kind of hit at the end of this phase of my life where I was really excited about this. So in Jeff Speck's report on walkability, he basically said, hey, the only way to fix this is to convert back to two ways. It just slows everything down while maintaining a similar amount of through traffic. And you know, the current one-way configuration provides the advantage of allowing people driving to ride a wave of green lights and take left turns unimpeded by oncoming traffic. Um, the disadvantages are increasing the danger to people and undermining retail viability, lengthening tricks and trips and confusing people, because apparently one-ways are confusing. I don't think they're that bad. But each of these disadvantages reflects just different populations who are all part of Lancaster County and even Lancaster City. Um, the decision will ultimately be made by weighing the interests of drivers passing through downtown against the interests of downtown residents, workers, and business owners. So for me, I think the big takeaway in all of this is this is really a political issue than it is, and, and you know, like different visualizations and all these type of things. I think a lot of people know the roads are fast, and really now it's down to convincing people to vote based on that. And I think it really just kind of stinks that everything in life kind of boils down to these political issues, but here we are. Um, but at the end of the day, the solutions I think are relatively clear and we kind of, if the right people all get together and agree that we need to change this, it probably would get changed. But right now I think the status quo, people want the roads to be faster. And it's kind of the harsh reality, but that's where I'm kind of moving forward from here. So the question is, will there be a sequel to this talk? And Joshua really wanted me to make sure that I had a custom Fast and Furious. So this is supposed to be Tokyo Drift. It's Lancaster Drift. The answer is no, there will not be a sequel to this talk. Oh, but, oh so you say that now. Well, actually, I have two questions for you. Uh, <laughs> my first question wasn't a correction. It was a correction to make sure everybody stood why we went for two ways. So that doesn't count. <laughs> let me let me finish real quick and then we'll, oh, we'll yeah. And I think the biggest thing for me now is um, 
And if I want to change this, I kind of have come to acceptance that it's not through little tech widgets. It's probably through knocking on doors, which is a little bit harder, but it's kind of the reality of the situation. Right so, right. Yeah, uh, I don't think it would, I don't think it, I think it's got to be a pack, super pack. I don't know. I don't know much about politics, but I know that if you knock on doors and, you know, maybe you convince people to vote, like, you know, to, to be one way or another, that's probably the best way to make action here. And so I've kind of, I enjoy the tech aspect, but unless, you know, I, somebody sees some real genius to some of my stupid little ideas, I think probably if I really care, I'll go do that. So go, I'll get to you. Go ahead. Yeah, so Walnut, Walnut ends in a school zone. It goes right past Reynolds. And they actually go out and they put a little crosswalk sign in the middle of the street. I thought that was pretty cool. And it slows people down for sure. But then they remove it as soon as the, the school thing is done. But it's an interesting. They don't actually have a little, because it's 25 miles an hour, the speed limit, they don't even bother putting the little flashing lights up. It's kind of funny. So people don't even, yeah, it's interesting. That's weird. And they don't have the flashing lights, right? They don't have, they don't anything. And the West End is like one of the worst speeding areas. Orange is the worst. In town, and there's two schools along, two school crossings. Oh, wait, what did you say? What one? West End. Oh, yeah. One of them part does of that have city, the city, part of the township. Mm. Does have the um, reduced speed for it there. Reduced speed what? what for, even though it's a 25 mile an hour, it still has a reduced speed for 15. I guess I don't think it has flashing lights to go with that, though. It's just that's still pretty good. You to reduce yeah, it's an interesting. Qu it's an interesting question, though. Hey, hey Luke. Yeah. Uh, at the end of uh, Streets One, the first talk, uh, I believe you had mentioned that one of your crazy ideas, radar guns. So okay, I do have I do have a confession on this. I bought a radar gun. <laughs> I bought a radar gun that could be easily returned, because I was like, I'm just going to return this after I try it out. And I bought one that's designed for pitching, and it was a piece of junk, and I forgot to return it, and now I'm super mad at myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree radar guns would be interesting. I should have just paid the $100. Instead, I spent 50 and now I'm stuck with this thing. I should have spent the $100 on like a real trigger one, because I think it would have been interesting. I'm glad you remembered that. Well, so there actually are, so that's a Doppler. So they have a Doppler attachment for Raspberry Pis. So that would be really interesting to be able to put a Doppler attachment on a Raspberry Pi. If I found somewhere good to put it, we could get that data consistently. My big problem is really I can set up one of these or two of these, but like there's eight roads I think need fixing, and I really wanted to be able to like visualize that. But again, it comes back to this point. Like I think people know the roads are fast. I don't know. And I don't think like me making a cool website is gonna reach more than like a hundred people. I don't think you need more convincing than that bus data. Because the buses run all the same times as right. all the commuter times. You've got every road. Yeah. They can't go much faster than existing traffic. They won't go much slower than existing traffic other than they pick people up. So I don't know. Yeah, that's a good point. And and that yeah, and I think you're right. And I, you know what's lovely about that? It can be live. I can get that data immediately and put it on a map. Yeah, Mike. That I, seems like a good thing to try to, you know, feel around places to publicize that, see what if Lancaster newspapers would be interested in it, or mm. uh, We're just uh, to city council. council. Mm -hmm. um, Problem right. there is W rides the bus, wants to get there later. Well, the bus, if it hits you, will kill you. Oh, Even absolutely. if it's going 25, but when they're going 39. Yeah, I wouldn't discount it at all. I think the biggest issue, the it, I show this off here. I assume there's no big RRTA narcs in here. Maybe there are. But I really don't want them deleting that endpoint. You don't want half a dozen angry bus drivers showing up at your door saying you lost. Yeah, lost. that. Uh, yeah. Excuse me, <laughs> <laughs> What do you think this is? <laughs> so, so just give them the MP5 hashes. I'll give you because I could have put their actual names up. It would have been funny. I believe in name and shame a little bit, you know, because these guys, eh, but it's, it's too much. These people have families, I'm sure. Lose their life, yeah, no, it's not worth it. Go ahead, well, Mike. You could do that with your monitoring from your window, you know, like a website of the worst offenders every month. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
They have the things set up. They have the little radar things to see how fast we're going. Yes, but have you tried to put broadcasting what their name is and maybe doing an ma automated mailing to all their neighbors and warning them about it? <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, you mentioned our RTA and ARCs, but it would be interesting what they are doing with this data on their end. Um, I don't think they have anybody competent that works there. <laughs> No, I think that they pay consultants to build stuff for them, then stop paying them, <laughs> and then <laughs> they hope the software survives for 20 years. Did you send the drone over the buses that are going too fast? You know what's funny? I got on a bus, and I was like, I wonder what their name is. <laughs> You're looking up their speeds. And I was just joking. <laughs> Simpson, not Simpson. <laughs> I know, I'm just joking. I didn't actually look, but I, I just jump on the buses. I'm a big fan of jumping on buses. You see a bus, you should jump on the bus. Mike? So, we just we featured a lot, but I have a lot of respect. I have a lot of respect for you. And the time and effort you put in this, I think this is pretty amazing, number one. Thank you. Have you thought about using or making a product out of this or a service that you can take to other cities? I'm sure, I can't imagine that other places would not, would, would be interested in the value of what you'd be able to provide. That's my first question. Well, I created a hodgepodge of proof of concepts. Yeah, yeah. And I think the coolest thing is potentially, if you could get, if you could come up with a camera that could do this processing on device, and you could put that in a package and it could track speeds a little more adaptively, I think that's a kind of cool device that cities could use. But they have, they have, I think, I think, I, I think that most cities know they have a problem and are working on it where they're hiding from the problem. But it may not be documented. Because like right now, Lancaster has several roads right now, uh, including Prince and Queen that have the two, the two little magnetic strips that run across the road. You've all seen these, I'm sure. And they can just tell based on how fast the car rolls over them, like between the two, how fast cars are going. And they can also detect whether it's a car, bus, or bike. And they can do all types of crazy stuff. A lot of this does exist. And coming up with fancier or more high-tech solutions is fun for me. But there are whole industries that exist on this. Um, and if cities gave a shit, they have really good ways of doing it. And I know Lancaster does give a shit. And I've learned that since I re originally gave my first talk is Lancaster does give a shit. I think a lot of times they're just not getting the funding for these projects. Uh, a lot of the roads you're complaining about are state roads, which they can't yeah. control. Yeah, but they, they they've- They influence, but they can't control. So before, they have approval to turn, from PennDOT, they have approval to turn Duke and Lyme into two-way streets. It's just a budget thing and a desire to do thing. The new administration is not focused on these streets. Um, it's mostly, like it's, it's a affordable housing administration, which is a great goal. But I think a lot of like ARPA funding and all that used to go to converting streets to two ways, but it's not currently a priority. And that's a little bit why it's a political thing. It used to be a big priority of the city to convert roads to two ways, but right now it's been severely deprioritized. Um, it's a little bit, hard and that's why I think votes are probably the only way to change it because the data is there and I think the data has been gathered by a lot of people. You don't need me gathering more but at the end of the day if, if people think there are more important issues in the city which are a lot just simple you know like can people afford to live here issues it's hard to justify that we should be lowering streets. I personally think maybe we can do both uh, is is my take, but yeah. Anyway, I'm I don't want to like sit up here much longer. Oh, okay, uh, Mike. Uh, okay, fine. Last question. Okay. So my second question is. I feel like I telling you two questions just empowered you more. <laughs> this is my only second question. Okay. Yeah. The first one was to correct why they changed the streets. Yeah. Okay. Because most people don't don't know that history. It, it was a correctional question. Yeah. A comment. Yeah. So usually when I'm going north, I like. What street? Sorry? Duke. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's not a lot of traffic on No, it's there. super quiet. So for all the years since I've moved back here, I've timed the lights there. And I found that if I go 23 miles 
an hour from a, from a stopping from a spike. I'm um, stopping my bike. Like it's 23 miles an hour, I can make it the whole way through to the North Lancaster County. If I go 25, I'm going to be stopped somewhere along the way. So here's, here's my question. Is the rest of the city not set up that way, number one? And then part of that, when you're catching vehicles that are going faster than 25, are they like going from one light to another? Or are they going 35? So or just, then they have to stop. There? Yeah, regardless of whether the lights are timed at 23 or 25, and I, I could talk about that forever, if you catch a yellow light, and that light has been green for, let's call it, 45 seconds. You can do the math on how long it would take you to catch up to that timed light. And you would be able to go crazy fast in order to catch up for a few blocks. There's also an issue of there are huge segments of Walnut, Chestnut, Duke, or not, not Duke, uh, Prince and Queen, that have no, an orange, that have no lights at all. They're just long segments with no lights, so it doesn't even matter how the lights are timed. But um, the, the bigger issue on that is that the, everybody knows that if you, I don't know how many of you know this, but I learned this really fast, because I do drive in this city. If you, if a light turns green, and you turn right, and you go the speed limit, you will hit a red light. But if you turn right and you go really fast, you can catch the yellow and then you're in the timed lights. And you learn that really fast because people like just pick up on that fast. And it's called, um, they have a term for it even so much. It's like, it's like turn it and floor it or something like that. And once you learn that, you, like I even catch my, like, I catch my wife constantly. I'm like, look how fast you're going. You know, and like she's like, oh, well, I didn't even notice. I'm like. <laughs> You could kill, you could kill me, you know, or whatever. I'm not actually that dramatic. Does she smile? What? The what? Does she smile? No, my wife hates me. She wants to divorce me. Yeah, Mike, yeah. The, <laughs> no, the, uh, No, I, I'm always like, hey, honey, you know I'm doing a lot of research and playing with my toys on how the roads are too fast. And look at you, you're going 35 miles an hour, you know. It's pretty universal, I think. Every, I catch myself going that fast, you know, and it's, it's not that, I'm not saying anybody's, you know, to be clear, there are some people, if you walk home today or you drive home today, you will be driving on these streets and there will be people going really fast. There are people who go really fast and they're just truly reckless drivers. They exist everywhere. I'm never going to solve that. Nobody's going to solve that issue because these people, the only way they can be solved, I don't know, is it's just, but these people are reckless. That's where we want to button that's where probably an automated ticketing system, if you're going faster than 45 miles an hour in the city, you should get a ticket. But they'll never fly. Anyway, sorry, that, to answer your question, no, no, no. they are timed. But also, also, last thing is, lights can be timed super well initially, but these are really rigid systems. They, they, don't, they, they basically, like, from my understanding, these are not like these fluid neural nets that are like, oh, how do we optimize each road? They did some like rigid calculations, put the light systems in place, and then they add a new stoplight or they convert Mulberry and Charlotte to two-way. It screws up the whole network for the whole city. The lights I'm talking about that are screwed up are always Mulberry and Charlotte. They're always slightly out of sync with the wave. And if you're going this way, they're out of sync the wrong way where you can get caught at a red light. If you're going uh, west, you can actually get a slingshot from them. Because they put them in and they have to, it's really hard to rectify one ways and two ways. So it ends up starting screwing things up. And the ideal system is that um, you have a green wave, but really the ideal system is we just keep people safe and sometimes it sucks to drive. One thing I can tell you is I've lived here not that long, but I've never gotten stuck in traffic in Lancaster City unless they're doing construction of shut down one lane. The city has so much capacity of roads, it's absurd. Uh, I'm not saying we need to make it worse, but it's so good for the motorists right now. Me as a motorist, I don't think, oh, should I go through the city or around the city? I'm like, oh, I'm going to go through because I know I can just set cruise control at 25 and I don't even have to think. Don't even have to, anyway. Thank you all. I, I talk about this forever. I don't want to like hold up this specific 
uh, microphone, but I appreciate you all and, you know. Thank you.